Hello, and welcome to this IISS Virtual Adelphi launch of the latest book in our Adelphi series entitled Once and Future Partners, the United States, Russia, and Nuclear Nonproliferation. I'm your moderator. My name is Mark Fitzpatrick. I'm executive director of the IISS America's office in Washington, DC, where I'm sitting. I'm also director of the IISS Nonproliferation and Nuclear Policy Program. I'm joined today for this virtual Adelphi launch by the two editors and principal authors of the book, uh, Nonproliferation and Russia Experts and Friends of Mine, Dr. William Potter and Sarah Bidgood, who are speaking to us from California, getting up early uh, there for this launch. Just to introduce them briefly um, and then to uh, explain how we're going to proceed. Uh, Dr. Potter is director of the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, where he's also a professor of nonproliferation studies. Uh, Bill was trained as a Sovietologist, uh, and he's been uh, deeply engaged in Russia nuclear policy, studying it for many years. He's participated also as a delegate at every uh, nuclear nonproliferation treaty meeting since 1995. Sarah Bidgood is another uh, Russian expert. Uh, both of them are Russian speakers. She is a senior research associate and project manager at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Um, I, th I think it's fair to say that both Bill and Sarah are uh, Russo Russophiles, if, if it's okay to say that uh, today in this uh, uh, political circumstances. I've, I've been in Moscow with them twice and they, they show uh, an affinity for the culture uh, for the country. Um, the book that we are launching today is not Bill's first book on nuclear subjects. He's um, produced over 20 of them. And it's not his first Adelphi book. Six years ago, he and another um, uh, Center for Nonproliferation Studies associate, Galkar uh, Mukatsanova, produced an Adelphi book on nuclear politics the non and the non-aligned movement. Uh, so um, here's how we're going to proceed. Bill and Sarah are going to introduce their book. Uh, then we're going to welcome questions from those who are listening. If you are doing this through your computer, it's easy to type in a question in the chat function, and you can do that at any time, and then I can read them. Um, at the end, we will um, also, for those who are not on the computer but are uh, phoning uh, with their telephone, they can uh, uh, pose questions once we unmute the phones briefly, uh, and we'll ask the people who are not asking a question will keep um, themselves, um, their phones muted. So let me start off uh, by asking Bill and Sarah to um, tell us about their book. Thanks so much, uh, Mark, for the uh, kind introdu introduction. Uh, usually I, I like to begin my remarks with an anecdote, but in light of the very limited time we have this morning, I'm going to forego that approach and instead um, begin by explaining that uh, for me, our book represents a return to my academic roots. As you've already kind of suggested, I, I began to examine uh, Soviet uh, policy uh, some four decades ago uh, and was particularly interested uh, in Soviet and US nuclear export and nonproliferation policy. I'd been trained as a Soviet specialist at the University of Michigan, which had a huge political science department, but there was not a single course offered on the subject of nonproliferation. So it came somewhat as a surprise uh, for me when I began to conduct research on my first book on this subject to discover a number of parallels and areas of convergence in the perspectives and the policies of the two Cold War superpowers with respect to preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. What I found to be uh, remarkable was that despite the fact that the United States and the Soviet Union were ideological and military rivals, they still found it possible during some of the most frigid moments of the Cold War, uh, and importantly across both Democratic and Republic administra Republican administrations, to cooperate in this one sphere of nuclear nonproliferation. And yet, 
Surprisingly, given the importance of this cooperation, little has been written uh, about this uh, topic, which included joint efforts to forestall South Africa's attempts uh, to develop nu nuclear weapons, uh, to put in place guidelines to regulate international nuclear trade, uh, to strengthen international nuclear safeguards at the IAEA, to implement the Nonproliferation Treaty, uh, and even to draft a joint convention in the 1970s to prohibit radiological weapons. What Sarah and I sought to do in our uh, new volume was to look carefully at a number of specific instances of U.S.-Soviet cooperation during the Cold War with a particular eye to discerning the factors, uh, international systemic, bureaucratic, idiosyncratic, that made cooperation possible. By analyzing those factors and the obstacles that needed to be overcome, uh, we've sought to discern lessons from the past that might be applicable today at a time of plummeting U.S.-Russian relations, including in the sphere of nuclear nonproliferation. So what we propose to do in the, in the remaining uh, time we have for our introductory remarks is for Sarah to identify some of the key lessons we re, uh, derived from these past instances of U.S.-Soviet cooperation that may be most relevant for the current situation. After she shares uh, these findings, I'll conclude with several specific recommendations for future action. So I'll pause for the moment, uh, turn the, uh, the mic over to, to Sarah, and then come back uh, in a few moments. Okay, thank you so much, Bill, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so as Bill indicated, what I'd like to do now is to highlight some of the observations that we were able to derive about U.S.-Soviet non-proliferation cooperation from the cases that we examine in our volume. Um, we tease out seven in the book itself, but I'm going to highlight four here, and then I'd be happy to sort of delve into the rest of them or touch upon them during the Q&A or, or with you, Mark. Um, so one of the first commonalities that we see across the cases is that the leadership in Washington and Moscow during the period that we're examining both recognize the importance of securing one another's buy-in in achieving important non-proliferation objectives. And a vivid example of this phenomenon comes from one of the cases we look at that Bill mentioned, which is the establishment of the London Club, which formed the precursor to the Nuclear Suppliers Group. So after India conducted its peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974, Henry Kissinger uh, recognized that something needed to be done to kind of strengthen export controls and prevent this diversion of, of peaceful nuclear technology. But he was reluctant to have the United States pursue this effort unilaterally. And we have a, a great quote from some of our declassified um, archival literature that says he was, he was afraid that this would make the United States look like everybody's maiden ant, you know, clucking after the international community with a laundry list of non-proliferation requirements. Um, and in response to this fear, his staff immediately proposed uh, getting the USSR on board as a partner in these efforts. Um, they thought that Moscow would be willing to go a pretty far way with the United States um, in these efforts, in part because there weren't really any issue areas at this time where the Soviet Union had a less restrictive export control policy than the United States. And this is something that a number of high-level actors observed. Um, so this is how close cooperation on export control started in 1974 in the fall, and it highlights the importance that both sides ascribed to getting one another on board if they wanted to make progress on key issues. Um, the second observation that we were able to make about our cases is that um, there is a need for clear-eyed leadership in both capitals for recognizing the importance of non-proliferation cooperation, even when it didn't necessarily co coincide with their kind of narrow national interests. Um, we see this in one case in particular that Bill also alluded to, um, where the U.S. and the Soviet Union combined forces to prevent South Africa from testing a nuclear weapon in the summer of 1977. When Moscow figured out that Pretoria was uh, preparing a test site in the corner of the Kalahari Desert, probably following a tip-off they got from a spy, um, it came to the United States for help. The Soviet Union didn't have diplomatic relations with South Africa at the time, and they needed the United States to exert pressure on South Africa not to go forward with the test, which it did. Um, in doing so, Moscow risked revealing sensitive intelligence information and an, and an intelligence source uh, 
um, by approaching the United States with its satellite imagery that showed this test. And for its part, the United States put its relationship with South Africa on the line by cooperating with the Soviet Union on this issue. And it's important to remember that in these early days of the Carter administration, that relationship with South Africa included military cooperation in Angola. So this was actually kind of a risky move. Um, leaders on both sides nevertheless saw that they kind of needed one another to mitigate a shared nuclear threat. And this kind of clear-eyed leadership was really crucial in sustaining non-proliferation cooperation when times got tough. The third observation that we were able to tease out is about the role of high-level institutional advocates in promoting and sustaining non-proliferation cooperation, even during difficult periods in their political relationship. We know, for example, from the archival sources that Khrushchev himself met with Avril Harriman to talk about how best to control peaceful nuclear explosions when the LTBT negotiations were nearing their conclusion. And we know too that Brezhnev and Carter actually exchanged letters to one another about South Africa's test site. So this kind of high level interest in non-proliferation cooperation was really critical to keeping it going during some of the darkest moments of the Cold War. And last but not least, um, for this portion of the presentation, there were really strong long-term personal relationships between key figures on both sides uh, who were involved in carrying out non-proliferation cooperation. These relationships were built up over time because as we see in our cases, a lot of the same US and Soviet officials essentially worked these issues in a range of forums together across decades and got to know each other extremely well. Um, I can't think of a relationship that illustrates this better than that between Soviet Ambassador Roland Timurbaev and his longtime U.S. interlocutor, Ambassador George Bunn. Um, the two men worked together for decades. Uh, they genuinely liked one another, and they spent time, you know, outside of work looking at non-proliferation issues. And we have a great um, anecdote in the book where they they actually had a breakthrough on the safeguards provision of the NPT while they were taking a hike around Lake Geneva. Um, Timur Bayev himself, you know, attributes this close connection that he had with Bun to an appreciation that they both shared for the vital need to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And at least from where I'm sitting, it's pretty hard to imagine uh, U.S. and Russian counterparts feeling similarly about one another today, at least in part because they don't have these extended and frequent opportunities to interact. So this brings me to, to just my final point here. Um, in many of the cases that we look at, cooperation begot cooperation. So if things went really well in, you know, for example, the negotiations on a draft radiological weapons convention, which is something that happened and is something we can get into, then this carried over into other issues like negotiations on a CTBT or a chemical weapons convention, which were happening at around the same time. Um, it's a little sobering to think about what that means for today, um, but on that kind of somber note, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm, I'm tempted to talk about uh, Roland Timurbaev and George Bunn since uh, uh, Roland spent three years with me after he retired from uh, his uh, diplomatic service. And I know that George Bunn uh, kind of loved the times that he, they spent together in Monterey and at Stanford, continuing their close cooperation and moving more into the academic realm, writing articles together, uh, including uh, about the indefinite extension of the NPT in 1995. But let me make just a few uh, very uh, uh, brief recommendations. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that we find a way to restore what had been the hallmark of the NPT review process. Uh, and that uh, has to do with uh, cooperation of a meaningful sort between the United States and the Russian Federation. Uh, I'm surprised that I have to make this point today because I hadn't anticipated doing so when we began this book. But at the, at the last PrepCom uh, in Geneva in April and uh, May of, of this year, uh, in my view, there was a disgraceful and very rare uh, uh, sequence of exchanges that were so vitriolic in nature that uh, I had to pinch myself. I mean, uh, I wasn't old enough to have, uh, to have been in, in Geneva for negotiations in 61, and there wasn't an NPT at the time, uh, but I would have said that it was more likely 1961 during the height of the Cold War rather than 19, or rather 2018, given the 
the vitriol in the uh, remarks that were exchanged between the uh, heads of the American and Russian delegations. It set a very poisonous uh, tone and atmosphere for the subsequent deliberations. And so I think it's absolutely essential for us to somehow instill more empathy. And I think one way to do this is for us to undertake as formal as possible a comparative nuclear threat assessment so that we better appreciate precisely, you know, what are the threats that are regarded as most pressing, uh, both in Moscow and in Washington, hopefully with an eye to finding some common ground. I think uh, there also is a need to focus on uh, at least one area where there is considerable overlap of interests, and that has to do with countering nuclear terrorism. What I worry about uh, is that if there were uh, uh, an incident similar to the one that transpired in 1995 when a scientific or sounding rocket was launched off the coast of Norway. Uh, the Norwegians gave the Russian foreign minister, ministry prior notification of this uh, uh, launch test, but it wasn't communicated to appropriate command and control authorities in Russia. And so when this multi-stage sounding rocket took off, it was interpreted uh, as a uh, submarine launched ballistic missile uh, fired from a U.S. submarine. Now, fortunately, this was 1995, and allegedly, uh, President Yeltsin said, my friend Bill would never do this to me. It was a single rocket, uh, and cooler heads prevailed. But I worry very much that were a similar uh, sounding rocket or multiple rockets to be launched today, uh, what the uh, result would be. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, one of the cases that we look at is a, a rather uh, unusual case in the late 1970s when the United States and the Soviet Union actually succeeded in drafting Convention on the Prohibition of Radiological Weapons, something that today we associate mainly with non-state actors, but at the time, and I would argue today, uh, also uh, remain very much a part of, uh, of uh, potential arsenals of, uh, uh, of, of states. And I think it may be uh, worthwhile at a time when the United States and the other uh, nuclear weapon states have a very difficult time finding anything that they like uh, about the, the prohibition treaty uh, or any other form of nuclear disarmament to revisit the draft US-Soviet convention uh, that was before the CD uh, in the late 1970s. And finally, to, to kind of wrap up here, I think what came through most strikingly as we sought to kind of derive lessons uh, from the different cases that we examined was the vital importance of institutional memory, uh, which I think is sorely lacking on nonproliferation issues in both the United States and the Russian Federation. Uh, there simply isn't the uh, personal uh, remembrance of uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis or other close calls that we have had. And I think we have to find a way to revive that institutional memory and also to replenish the expertise in both capitals uh, with respect to nonproliferation. So uh, we take as our mission uh, at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, and I would encourage others to do so as well, uh, to try to train the next generation of nonproliferation specialists. And one way that we're doing it, which gives me a little bit of hope, is a, a new dual degree in nonproliferation studies that we're conducting with the Moscow State Institute of International Relations and Monterey. We're now with our third class of students who study both Moscow and Monterey. And hopefully some of those in the future will be the uh, contemporary Roland Timmerbiovs and George Buns. So with that, Mark, why don't I conclude uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to questions that the audience may have. Thanks very much, Bill. Thanks, Sarah. This was a very good introduction. Uh, you know, you could only, uh, in a way, skim uh, the surface of what's a very uh, uh, deep book. Uh, easy to read, though, because it's, it's so clear. I had a couple questions, and then I will uh, uh, encourage anybody listening to uh, type in questions, and then we will unmute the phones in a little bit. But let me start off. In one sense, if one kind of listened superficially, you might think that um, this, uh, the good old days uh, uh, era of uh, cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States in the area of nonproliferation uh, 
uh, was, um, you know, based on um, altruism. You know, it, it, there were personal uh, relationships. There was an understanding of the importance of, of mutual buy-in. There was a, a, a cooperation. But um, I'm pretty sure that it wasn't <laughs> just altruism, that there was a, a hard-nosed understanding of uh, the imperatives of national security and why uh, non-proliferation was important to each side's national security. Now, here's my question. Uh, looking at this cynically, you know, one might say that there was this cooperation because these two leading members of the small nuclear weapons club had a, had an interest in keeping everybody out. So uh, it was it was just to keep the door closed that they cooperated. But can you tell me a little bit more about your your thoughts on you know, why it was so important for the, the national interests of each side? Uh, sh sure, uh, Mark. And in fact, uh, you may even give me the opportunity to refer to my earlier Delphi book uh, dealing with NAM and nuclear politics, because certainly uh, a, a number of NAM countries uh, would uh, argue, much as you have, uh, that what we were witnessing was superpower collusion uh, to try to create a situation, a world in which a, a very few countries had nuclear weapons and the others uh, uh, were uh, discriminated against. But I think in order to understand uh, the manner of cooperation that evolved, uh, and I do want to don't want to suggest that it, you know that uh, uh, everybody saw eye to eye from the outset. I think both countries had to experience uh, rather unpleasant circumstances in which their own nuclear assistance contributed to the spread of nuclear weapons. So the, the, the Soviet Union actually had uh, the initial learning experience and that had to do with their uh, relationship with China and the assistance that was provided uh, by the Soviet Union in the 1950s um, that clearly uh, facilitated the uh, first uh, Chinese uh, nuclear test. Uh, it's a complex story, and uh, new archival information uh, suggests some interesting domestic political uh, developments that influenced both the initial desire by the Soviet Union and Khrushchev to cooperate with Mao, and why ultimately uh, the Soviets and the uh, Chinese split. But it was a very important learning experience because following that, uh, the Soviet Union tore up its prior nuclear arrangements with a number of East European countries, insisted on the return of spent fuel from the reactors, uh, and modified uh, significantly the kind of nuclear assistance that they provided. Um, the comparable learning experience for the United States occurred about a, uh, well, occurred in 1974. We know exactly when it occurred. It occurred in May of 1974 when the Indians detonated what they euphemistically called a peaceful nuclear uh, explosion. And so what we notice after that is a dramatic shift uh, in the attention that both the United States and the Soviet Union place on cooperation. And as we detail, as Sarah details uh, in a chapter in our book, you see the emergence of cooperation with respect to trying to regulate uh, nuclear exports. And I think one of the most interesting things, and I'll kind of conclude on, on this note, is that during the, uh, the NSG, the early days of the NSG, uh, you saw the United States and the Soviet Union actually cooperating more closely than the United States did with its traditional allies. I was told uh, in my own research on the topic that there were occasions when the Americans or the Soviets couldn't make a meeting and they essentially gave their proxy to the other party. <laughs> so, uh, it was a remarkable set of circumstances. And, you know, th these things didn't uh, uh, materialize out of thin air. They, they were these relationships that were developed over the course of the negotiation of the NPT and other uh, arms control uh, deliberations that occurred after 62. And I think that's the, maybe the, the other point that I should make here, you know, a major driver for cooperation was not only the desire to prevent other countries from acquiring nuclear weapons, but a recognition of how close a call we had had uh, the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, 
And that's something that deeply affected uh, the leadership of both the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, and I think gave rise to subsequent negotiations, including the negotiation of the NPT. Thanks, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Sarah? I would agree. Sure. Thanks, Mark. I'd agree with everything that Bill said. And, um, you know, just to provide a little uh, additional um, nuance and some of the details from the case, you know, I think one of the things that we found in looking across these is that um, both the United States and Soviet Union appreciated that their image in the international community improved when they were able to cooperate together. So you're exactly right that it wasn't just kind of an altruistic, um, you know, appreciation of, of the need to rid the world of nuclear weapons. They were thinking in a hard-nosed fashion. They understood that they looked better at the NPT when they could cooperate. They they looked better in the eyes of the rest of the world when it appeared that they were taking steps to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So that's kind of one, you know, overarching theme that we see across the cases. Um, I did want to mention too that, you know, in the context of um, the the London Club and this these initial efforts to um, develop stronger multilateral export controls, you know the. The Soviet Union, or the United States rather, was competing with the Soviet Union economically in the sphere of nuclear exports. And that's part of the reason, you know, why Kissinger and his staff were so reluctant to go out unilaterally and try to strengthen export controls. They saw that they would undercut their own economic interests, that they made it more difficult for themselves alone to export nuclear uh, equipment and dual-use equipment. And so they needed the Soviet Union to be on board so that they wouldn't allow their competitor to get an edge. So that's, you know, one, one important thing to note. And then, again, in the context of negotiating these multilateral export controls, um, the U.S. had a very similar position to that of the Soviet Union. They wanted full-scope safeguards on nuclear exports. Um, they, they wanted to kind of take a hard line on this issue. But because they had to navigate this tricky space between keeping the Soviet Union engaged, but also working with their allies, they had to bridge the gap between countries like France, who had no interest in full scope safeguards, um, and the Soviet Union, who was um, more on the hard line. And so we can see in from the declassified literature that the United States it seemed like really relied on the Soviet Union to kind of be the bad cop, which freed the US up to have a more flexible position and give it some more flexibility and space to um, continue to maintain its alliance relationships while knowing that it was, that there was somebody who was going to push for these very stringent export controls. So I just, um, you know, highlight those as a couple of examples of the, the very point that you highlight, which is that there were certainly hard nosed interests at play here that impacted upon the nature of cooperation. Great, great. I like those examples and uh, and uh, the, the, the bad cup, good cup uh, uh, interplay. Um, just uh, following up on one thing here, I was struck reading the book how the Soviet Union had these strict export controls uh, and, and they, you know, had safeguards before other um, nuclear suppliers. That was, a, that was interesting. I, I knew uh, that the, the Soviet Union required the return of spent fuel and, and uh, Correct me, but I think Russia still does. Um, but uh, but they changed along the way in terms of uh, the requirements in terms of their nuclear exports. You know, as I understand it, today Russia doesn't require um, any um, standards beyond uh, application of IEA safeguards when um, they export their their nuclear technology. And I, and I draw a comparison to the U.S. gold standard. Uh, not applied everywhere, but try. They try. The United States at least tries to persuade countries to forego enrichment and reprocessing, something that you mentioned that the Soviet Union did with regard to its uh, allies in Eastern Europe. Why did the Why did Moscow, um, be, you know, relax its uh, its posture on this? And is there any any ideas you have about getting back to a more stricter um, uh, application of good governance uh, norms for nuclear exports? Right. Thank, thanks, Mark. I mean, I talk a little bit about this in, in one of the chapters when I look at the, the evolution of both U.S. and Russian policy and kind of the change from secrecy and denial to technology control uh, to uh, an emphasis on uh, you know, the primacy of, of politics. And I think uh, to, look, to address your specific question about the change in Soviet policy, 
It actually precedes the collapse of the Soviet Union. One can point to the late 1980s uh, and the rise of kind of private nuclear entrepreneurs, but also shifts in terms of the decision-making process in the Soviet Union, uh, which in the past had really been driven by uh, tech snob export and the foreign ministry and defense policy considerations, uh, a very uh, you know strict approach to nuclear exports. And you saw an erosion of, of uh, those state actors and their influence over policy and the rise of more private nuclear entrepreneurs. Um, and that that continued uh, in the early period, uh, you know, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in fact, maybe the, the best example of this, this was in the early 90s, was the emergence of a company known as the Chetek Corporation. This was a corporation made up uh, predominantly of impoverished uh, nuclear scientists from the major nuclear facilities who actually developed a very glossy brochure and went around the world trying to market uh, so-called peaceful nuclear explosions for environmental purposes. You know, if you have chemical waste that you want to destroy or chemical munitions, there's nothing better to use than a peaceful nuclear explosion. So, uh, and this was subsidized by uh, uh, leadership, uh, you know, in uh, the Ministry of Atomic Energy at the time, because it was seen as a, a necessary kind of step to uh, uh, provide the livelihood of, uh, of Soviet and post-Soviet scientists during very difficult moments. So I would say the uh, the the policy, the parties became more uh, capitalistic, if you will, market oriented. You saw a change in the domestic decision making process in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and so uh, unfortunately, from a nonproliferation standpoint, uh, considerations of, of, uh, of capital uh, began to trump, oh, I hate that word, uh, began to uh, take precedence over uh, considerations of, of nonproliferation. And it's not simply on the, on, on the Soviet side. I, I think the best example of this you know, today is the uh, debate over you know, should India uh, gain uh, membership in the nuclear suppliers group. Uh, here you have, I think, an unusual and I would argue unfortunate uh, convergence of interest between the United States and the Russian Federation, but it's a convergence of interests which again places considerations other than nonproliferation at the fore. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I've got a bunch more questions myself uh, relating the past to the to the future, the title of your book. But let me turn to others who are listening in, and first of all, uh, pose a question that was sent via computer um, by Deborah Decker. And then after your answer to this, we'll open up the mics. Uh, Deborah says, congrats on the Adelphi book, very timely. I just wrote on Putin's recent summit suggestion for engagement. Is there any chance of this happening? How can we help move this forward? Thoughts? Well, uh, yeah, I can, you know, first of all, the, you know, this meeting, uh, was not a great day in terms of transparency. <laughs> and so, uh, Deborah may have a better clue as to what actually transpired uh, behind closed doors uh, than do I. I, I mean, I uh, certainly applaud uh, more routine, regular, high-level interactions between officials in our two countries, and that would include you know, uh, the presidents of these countries. But there also has to be uh, meaningful routine interactions between experts. And one of the, the hallmarks uh, of the period in the, the uh, mid 1970s to the late 1980s were uh, meetings that took place every six months at the assistant secretary level uh, on nonproliferation issues, where basically everything was on the table. Uh, and it was a very productive way to conduct business. Uh, I don't see anything like that uh, at the moment. And so I would say if, in fact, there were an agreement uh, to perhaps revive the U.S.-Russia Bilateral Presidential Commission working groups, which included those in the arms control area, uh, 
uh, so that you had routine meetings, uh, that would be great. So meetings of presidents is excellent, are excellent, but you need to move forward and facilitate routine interactions among representatives of the nuclear labs, uh, uh, mill-to-mill -mill, uh, interactions, uh, parties who can in fact implement policy with respect to a range of nonproliferation issues. Okay, thanks, Bill. I hope that uh, satisfied Deborah. Now um, we're going to try this: opening, uh, un unmuting the mics. Um, if you if you have a question, state your name and uh, a short question, and try not to talk over each other if there is more than one person wanting to pose questions at the same time. Um, anybody out there? Okay, I don't hear anybody out there right now, so I'm going to go ahead and pose one, and we'll, we'll open mics again in a minute. Um, the, um, the I was very struck by the um, the mention um, you made, um, authors, of how the United States and and Moscow uh, coordinated their positions with each other, uh, shared their talking notes, uh, even uh, before they did so with allies. Um, that was an extraordinary level of, of cooperation. And I recall some incident in the past uh, couple of years where this did happen um, recently. I can't remember if it was with regard to the Iran nuclear negotiations or something else where um, Washington uh, coordinated first with Moscow. And at the time, I thought, oh, this is terrible. How do you do this before even doing it with allies? But can you think of cases recently or um, or coming up where this would be a logical way to proceed, maybe with the North Korean case? Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, I there are a number of examples that we look at in the book, and I'm thinking here in particular of the negotiations on the draft radiological weapons convention, where the U.S. and the USSR did, in fact, um, cooperate extremely closely, not not only on the negotiation of the arms control measure itself, but then on kind of how they were going to market it, so to speak, when they introduced it to the CD, because, you know, that wasn't the end of the journey for that treaty. They they created a draft, but then they needed to kind of sell it um, to the multilateral community and stick together on that particular issue. So you're certainly right that that was one of the, the key hallmarks of non-proliferation cooperation that, that we see in the book. Um, we wondered, I was just having a, a quick consultation with Bill here, we, we wondered if maybe uh, the Syria chemical weapons issue could have been um, yeah. one where the United States and the Russian Federation kind of shared close talking points or shared notes, but I could certainly have imagined that being the case as well during the JCPOA. In, in, in fact, Mark, if I can weigh in here, I mean, I, the Syrian CW case is quite interesting, and although it wasn't, uh, you know, in the purview of our book, it uh, reinforces the point about the importance of personal relations, because it turns out that many of the key policymakers on the U.S. and Russian side who were involved in the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program dealing with CW uh, issues uh, in the former Soviet Union were precisely the same parties who re-engaged uh, in an effort uh, which at the time we thought was successful uh, to cooperate in uh, facilitating the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. So they were able to kind of jumpstart that process uh, because some of the same parties, whether it's Laura Holgate and Andy Weber uh, and the like and their Russian counterparts uh, were familiar with one another and could cut to the chase and, uh, and work together. But I would note too, Mark, I mean, your your point is well taken that there is, you run the risk when you take this approach of, of having outside observers think, oh my goodness, you know, why are the United States and the Russian Federation consulting with one another before Pollution. they sort of- Pollution. Exactly, exactly. And in this environment, I think that that's, you know, one of the particular challenges that we faced in kind of making our recommendations is how do you initiate closer cooperation when there's an outside environment that perceives this in a negative light? But I would argue that this actually isn't, I mean, it's a different circumstance, but the U.S. and the, and the Soviet Union faced similar accusations um, during the period of time that we look at. As Bill mentioned, there were frequent, uh, oftentimes the, the two uh, nuclear powers were accused of being engaged in superpower condominium or superpower collusion. And so, you know, that's not a new claim. And I think it's just if your priority is non-proliferation, you know, you can't not have the expertise of the two largest nuclear powers kind of helping one another um, 
to, to make progress on that issue area, and that's just something you have to get beyond. Good point. Uh, we're, I'm going to try again to unmute uh, the telephones to see if anybody listening via telephone wants to pose a question. Um, I've, uh, I've got a question, Mark. Please. Uh, it's Paul Ingram from BASIC uh, in London. Hi, Paul. And, uh, hi, Mark. Uh, good to hear you. Um, I, uh, I wondered if there was uh, any uh, conversation uh, over this period between the U.S. and Russia, uh, uh, the Soviet Union, rather, around the linkage between disarmament and non-proliferation and whether they needed to... Uh, to um, to put more efforts into the disarmament area in order to 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 reinforce or bolster the efforts that you that you've been uh, discussing, or whether this was actually seen as very separate and that the uh, the effort at uh, controlling non-proliferation was uh, very separate and uh, uh, needed to be pursued in its own right, and the disarmament track uh, was was dealt with. Definitely. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Paul. That's a well-posed question. Uh, Bill and mm -hmm. Sarah? Well, okay. Let me try. Um, if I understood Paul's uh, kind of point here, I wasn't sure what time frame we were, we were talking about here. Um, I would say, uh, you know, historically, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, while clearly particularly focused on the non-proliferation pillar, uh, in the treaty, uh, also uh, acted uh, in a significant fashion uh, on the disarmament front, although uh, an area in which they were also kind of uh, criticized for collusion was that they did not uh, like uh, to discuss bilateral nuclear disarmament issues with others in NPT fora. They basically said, this is our business. Uh, we're making good headway. We don't need to be reminded of, uh, of what we should be doing uh, in this regard. And so they were not at all happy about that. Um, uh, I would say that um, today it, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, again, I, cause I'm at, ironically, uh, one uh, area where the United States and the Russian Federation have tended to see eye to eye is in their condemnation of the uh, prohibition uh, treaty, the Treaty on the yeah. Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But it is quite interesting, and I think this is indicative of the downward spiral more generally in terms of US-Russia uh, relations, including in the nuclear space is that at the recent NPT meeting in Geneva, uh, the Russian Federation, when speaking on nuclear disarmament, mentioned that while they did not agree with the proponents of the Prohibition Treaty, that they respected their views, but they actually were far more concerned with the transgressions of the United States with respect to uh, non-compliance with the NPT, non-compliance with this, that, and the other thing. And so uh, that represented actually a, you know, quite a significant change because on nuclear disarmament, at least, the United States uh, and Russia, uh, along with the other uh, five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, tended to uh, stick together more often than not. And so we saw those fissures very, very pronounced uh, in Geneva. Uh, and I think also, as, as Paul well knows, uh, with respect to uh, you know, verification efforts, the, uh, the Russian Federation uh, uh, is now quite wary of engaging uh, with what are predominantly Western states in looking at new uh, approaches to verifying disarmament. So again, that might change. Uh, and I think because it has a technical nature, it's an area that in the future, you know, uh, might be a, a good starting point for re reviving U.S.-Russian cooperation. But at the moment, uh, it looks rather stillborn. Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, so, hi, Paul. Thanks for your question. Um, I just had a couple of thoughts to add to what Bill said. First, um, you know, I think today we tend to think about arms control as just reductions. But if we look at the sort of larger scope, which is, you know, controlling behavior of states, 
Um, I think we saw a larger overlap between some of what the United States and the Soviet Union were doing in non-proliferation and what they were doing in terms of arm control, arms control. And I'm thinking here specifically of one of the cases that we look at in the book where we talk about <clears throat> negotiating controls over peaceful nuclear explosions. I mean, I think you can argue that in many ways that's, that's you know, as much an arms control measure as it is a non-proliferation measure. I think the same thing can be said about the draft radiological weapons convention that the US and Soviet Union negotiated. I mean, that could be an arms control measure in addition to being a non-proliferation measure. I'd also just make the case, um, you know, in that in that context that um, I both the United States and the Soviet Union, I think, sometimes regarded progress in non-proliferation as something that would help uh, their arms control efforts. And I'm thinking here specifically of the SALT negotiations in 1974. Um, those did not go the way that the that the admin, the U.S. administration had hoped in in March of that year. And that's really when they started looking at cooperating on radiological weapons convention issues. So they kind of saw that as a way to facilitate cooperation in one area that would then spill over into the arms control space. So I just wanted to, to kind of flag okay. that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, last question, and we'll make this short because we're um, just uh, at the time. Um, looking to the future partners part of this, isn't North Korea uh, an obvious case where there is an obvious need for uh, cooperation? And do you expect uh, this to um, proceed? Um, I would hope so, Mark. I mean, you and I were both at a meeting in Moscow uh, where there were U.S. and Russian, you know, experts, uh, practitioners, uh, uh, a couple of days before the Singapore summit. Um, and what struck me, and um, you may have had a different perspective, uh, was that the views that were expressed around the table did not fall neatly into American and Russian camps. That there were really, uh, I think there were parties on both sides who uh, saw uh, potential positive developments. Uh, this, is, mind you, is in advance of the summit and those who, who were skeptical. Uh, but I think most parties agree that if in fact there's going to be progress, if in fact the, uh, the North is serious about denuclearization, and if, in fact, the United States is serious about uh, denuclearization, that the Russians uh, could play a very significant role, as could the, uh, the South Koreans uh, and the Chinese. So to the extent that one is hopeful about movement in this space, and I can't admit to being particularly uh, optimistic, uh, I think it will require uh, engagement and collaboration uh, between the United States uh, and the Russian Federation, among others. So it's it's a, a perhaps it's a benchmark that we can uh, look at uh, uh, another year or two from now. Um, so I hope that's responsive to your question. Yes, yes, it is. Well, um, thanks very much, Bill. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for leading this WIWS virtual uh, Adelphi launch. Thank you all uh, who are listening. Sorry that I didn't get uh, more of you in to pose questions. This uh, discussion uh, has been recorded and will be posted on the IISS uh, website uh, pretty soon. Uh, meanwhile, I've got a, a team of people here been taking notes, and uh, we're going to uh, draw some of the best uh, 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 anecdotes and, uh, and, and bone mows uh, for Twitter feed. So uh, until then, um, everyone have a good day, and, uh, and see you again in Moscow, Bill and Sarah. Thanks, Thanks so much, Mark. Mark.